you have your Bibles, open it to Genesis 29. I'm still with Jacob here. Actually, this is a this is a a, a marriage and family series. If you go to the internet, that's where you'd find this on the internet. And I'm in chapter 29, and we're going to try to look at is the, how the will of God works in a person's life, both in a positive, always in a positive way, but when we make bad decisions, you're going to see how that affects your life once the directive will of God has been revealed to you. And so I'm in 29, and Jacob has got himself in a mess with his family, and his family has shipped him off, tried to cool down the family, shipped him off to Haran, so to speak, and uh, have sent him there with intentions to let the family cool down because Esau wants to kill him. And, um, and he is to get, while he's there, get a bride. And that will make his trip worth the time. <laughs> Sound like a parent, doesn't it? Yep. Well, since you're there, why don't you get do something constructive with your life? <laughs> um, so here we are in chapter 29. We're in 25, uh, <clears throat> verse 25 through 29. And um, Laban, he's been there a while, and Laban suggests that he shouldn't be working I mean, he's a good enough worker. He should be getting paid. And uh, he says, okay, uh, let me work for the dowry for Rachel. And he said, all right. And so they entered a seven-year contract, a dowry for Rachel. Room and board dowry, the money part would go. And so R Laban thought that was a pretty good deal. What Jacob didn't understand because he wasn't from that culture now, and his parents apparently didn't brief him because he left in a hurry on customs, their customs. And the older Mesopotamian customs, the older daughter has to be married before anyone else in the family. Any other daughter can get married. Nobody, Jacob didn't think to look into it because he entered a contract for Rachel. You can understand why he didn't look into it. Uh, Laban didn't offer that because he thought he had a pretty good deal for seven years, thought he could get rid of Leah. Oh, tender eyes. Tender eyes. Well, there you go. Sound like a slab of meat, doesn't it? No. Sound like a slab of meat. Well, any, anyhow, uh, wedding time came. He, seven years, he couldn't get rid of this older daughter. He thought this would be a piece of cake. And so now we have a wedding. Uh, only two people know that's involved in the wedding ceremony that this is not the real deal for him. Uh, Laban knows it and Leah knows it. And I suppose now the third party knows it, probably helped her get ready, is Rachel. So it's a mess going in. And so we pick this story up at verse 25. So it came about in the morning that behold, that is the, the, that's the honeymoon morning. So it came about in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served with you? Why then have you deceived me? Laban said, it is not the practice in our place to marry off the younger before the first born. Complete the week of this one, and we will give it the honeymoon. And we will give you the other also for the service for which you served with me another seven years. Now, the first time was a dowry. This time it's not. This, this, is, this is work. This is purchase. I mean, this is purchase. The first time it was all about grace and dowry and all that business. This time it's not. Now, he doesn't have to agree to this, does he? Now, he doesn't have to agree to that, but he does. Unfortunately, he does. 
So Jacob did so, completed his week, and he gave him his daughter, Rachel, his wife. And then, then Laban gives handmaids to all the girls in the family. Now we got, we got four, four mothers off this one bad deal. We got four mothers going to give birth to 12 kids, and they're going to be called the tribe of Israel. I mean, they're a tribe. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this tonight in the greater scheme of the plan of God after a word of prayer. <clears throat> I give you a moment of silence as a believer, priest, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit because you live in the church age of the new covenant. Galatians 3, 2 reminds you that the moment you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, the Holy Spirit took up residence in your soul, in your body. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 says, your body became the temple of God because it was purchased by God to indwell the Holy Spirit. And the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You can't study it. You can't learn it in the flesh and you can't apply it in the flesh. It is a book for born again people and it is a book that must be learned and lived by the filling ministry of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, carnality cannot get it, can, can't, can't learn it, can't apply it. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. Your responsibility as a believer priest, according to 1 Peter 2, a believer priest, your responsibility is confess sin. You confess it to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess it to the Lord, and he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. This restores you to fellowship of 1 John 1, 5, and allows the Holy Spirit to be what he has been chosen to be in the hour of study, the great teacher. So I give you a moment to confess sin. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins. It's your responsibility to take care of it. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these who have come our way by automobile and by internet. And I pray those who are on the internet, as they sit in their home or wherever they are, uh, they would uh, isolate them, uh, them uh, the opportunity to let the, quote, still small voice of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit speak the word of God directly to them and uh, bring them into awareness of the importance of the application of it to their life and to their ministry to other people. I pray tonight, Father, as we look at how this, this spiritual mature believer chose bigamy over monogamy. How, how could he do that? <clears throat> well, when you go negative to the plan of God, when you go negative to the directive will of God, you get yourself in a mess. You just keep digging holes bigger than you could possibly get out of. And uh, confession of sin helps you. It restores you to a place where God can be in charge again in your life. And, uh, boy, thankful for it in my life. I pray tonight the story of Jacob would remind us how important the will of God is to our life as it's revealed to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, notice that my opening sentence is very important to your life. You get nothing else, get this one tonight. Laban may have deceived and tricked Jacob. We're all subject to that, aren't we? But he didn't trick God. Nobody can trick God. I mean, that's why he's sovereign. Can't trick him. And that's important to this story. It's important to your life. One morning you wake up and you think, man, I have been deceived. Well, it depends on what you do with it. Because I can tell you God hasn't been deceived. You may have been honestly deceived, but he hasn't. And therefore, he is very important in how you fix it. If there's a message for you tonight, it's certainly that message. What is important to this story is Bethel. Bethel is so important to this story, I can't begin to tell you. Because 
He stopped at Bethel. You know, he named it. It was Luss, and he named it Bethel, the house of God, because he had this famous theophany, the appearance of God. Remember, and we call, we call it famously Jacob's Ladder. What God told him, now that was the last stop he made before he arrived at Haran. Remember that. These, these, this was just before he arrived. I put this at the top of your paper. And here's what he told him. This is what, and listen, this is a theophany. This is not a canary flying in and dropping a message. This is God Almighty. This is the directive will of God. I mean, he was so impressed with it. It was, his life became radically changed by this experience he had of a theophany at Bethany. Here's what the Lord told him. I wrote it down for you. In chapter 28, verse 15. Now, the, all that God said to him is verses 13, 14, 15. I'm just pulling out one verse. Because I want you to tell you, I, this is the last thing God told him that was important. The rest of it was connected to the Abrahamic covenant. This is what he told him personally. This is personal. Now. He said, behold, I am with you, Jacob. Because Jacob is running for his life. He says to him, look, look, son, I am with you. He says to Jacob, I am with you. Number two, I will keep you wherever you go. That should be wherever, I suppose. Wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will bring you back to the land. That's, that's the Abrahamic covenant. You remember the Abrahamic covenant has three great pillars. It has the land, the seed, and the blessings, right? That's three big pillars of the Abrahamic covenant. And he's talking about that to him. In verses 13, 14, and 15, he, he talks about the Abrahamic covenant and these three great pillars of doctrine. Look at what he, look at, I will, behold, I am with you. I will keep you. I will bring you back. I will not leave you until I have done what I promised you. Now, that's a whole lot of God. That's a whole lot of God, right? And specific. That's a whole lot of, that's a whole lot. And listen, when God signs off on it, you, you can bank on it. What do he say? I promise you. You with me? I promise you. That's important to this lesson. Because when God gives you the directive will of God, this is what he's talking about. This is what he promises you. The directive will of God, you can apply this verse to you. I am with you. I will keep you. I will bring you. I, I will never leave you. I will fulfill my promise to you. That's a big deal. That is a big deal. And we have Hebrews, the 13 chapters. He says the same thing to us under the new covenant. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Even when you forsake him and leave him, he will never do that to you. He doesn't play that game. If you do it to me, I do it back to you. That's the game we play in the flesh. And I can't tell you how important the directive will of God is because he just attached a whole lot of I will to it. Now, here's point. I've got five things about the subject. Jacob chose bigamy over the monopoly. Monopoly. <laughs> That's what he was in, wasn't he? Point number one. The directive will of God always works with three important categories in mind. It's called the geographical will. These three things always have to line up. Here's the directive will of God. That's what God has revealed to you out of his word. This is, Jacob, this is what I'm going to do for you. This is what I promise. And there's always three things that have to line up under it. 
there's the geographical will. That's where it's going to take place. This is what it's all about. There is the mental will of God. That's a what. And there's the operational will of God. The operational will of God. That's a who. The mental will of God. And then how. The how. So you got the geographical will of God. Where is it going to take place? You got the mental will of God. What's, what, what's this about? And then you have the operational. You know, how, how is this going to work? How, how is it going to get done? How, how is this going to work? So you got the geographical, the mental, and the operational will of God. Those three things are always lined up. They have to line up. And if you read verses 13, 14, and 15, you'll see that's what he talks about. And he said, listen. And listen, he tells you. What's he say? You're over here now. I want you to pay, pay attention, and I'm going to bring you back, right, to the land. You're in Haran. You shouldn't be, but that you are, right? Don't, you're never going to leave the land. Stay in the land is called the what land? Promised land. But since you are, pay attention to me because I'm going to take you back. And wherever you go, I've got you covered, and I'm going to take you. I'm going to take you home, right? Well, you. The directive will of God in your life, those three things always have to line up. They can't be two of them, can't be one of them. All three got to line up. And that's very important. That's very important to the directive will of God. You got to pay attention to that stuff. There's always a where, there's always a what, and there's always a how. And he's, when he gives you the directive will, you know why. The directive will tells you why. All right. Jacob, now remember, when Jacob left home, he was the patriarch heir of the Messianic seed. Right? That, that's who he was when he left. And God reminds him that in verse 13 and 14 and tells him what he'll do in verse 15 about it. That's, that was really important to Jacob. <clears throat> Now, all of this, the direct, getting the directive will of God, doctrinally, that, we call that categorical Bible doctrine. That's what we call that. We call it categorical Bible doctrine. Those three, three things line up like that. This whole process for this to work is 2 Corinthians 3.16, inhale, exhale. All scripture is God breathed. This whole principle here works out of inhale, exhale. You've got to learn it and then you've got to live it. You got to learn it and live it. Inhale, exhale. All scripture is God breathed. It's inhaled and it's exhaled. And that's really important. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, 15 through 17, I wrote on your paper. Therefore, be careful how you walk. I'll tell you why. Because in the world, the devil puts booby traps. He can't hide him from God. And so God, it's important that he guides our step. That's what he just told Jacob. Did he not tell him that? Listen, you're going to need me because you're going to walk in a minefield. And boy, did he ever. Was Haran not a minefield for Jacob? It shouldn't have been because God wouldn't go, don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. He, he said, I look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through it. I'm going to walk you through it. Now, for you, our whole life is walking through the minefield. This is why you can't live a carnal life. You're going to get an arm blown off. You're going to get a leg blown off, your eye blown off. You can't walk through the minefield without God because he can tell you what each place, what it is. That's danger. Whoop, go around. It's hidden in the bush. Go around. Don't pet that. It's got a bomb in it. That's, that's why, listen, therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. That's paying attention. That's the inhale, exhale. Listen, you're not wise because you're in inhale. You're wise when you inhale, exhale. 
I mean, all you do is breathe in and never breathe out. Uh, lots of luck. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Don't walk as unwise, walk as wise. Making the most of your time. Because the days are evil. There's minefields, booby traps all over your world. This is the world the devil lives in. And he booby traps it. It's not a big deal for God. He knows where it all is. He's sovereign. But it's our time, and that's the best we get, and we walk through it. So then don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Because he's got your, he's got your geographic, mental, and operational will at heart and operational in your life in the directive will. Look, I try to make this stuff really simple. I mean, this is a lot more complicated, you know. I try to make it simple because in the truth of the matter is, it has to be simple enough to be understood and applied. See the key word in this verse? Look, the key word in that verse? You should circle it. It's the word understand. The whole secret to that verse, how you walk, walk wise, not foolish, is all based on your understanding of the will of God, right? Understand what? Understand what? What the will of God is. Now, it's not going to be a mystery. It's not a mystery. Unless you don't study the Bible. If you don't study the Bible, then it's a mystery. Everything else has been revealed in the Word of God. And if you're fortunate to have a pastor that understands this, then it should not, it, you, you're, you shouldn't ever walk into anything that you don't understand. Now, listen to me. This is important. God made it easy for Jacob regarding God's will for a wife and the mother of the Messianic seed. He made it easy. You know why? He took all the choices away. Listen, when he takes all the choices away from life, it's pretty easy to pick one. It's pretty, if there's only one, look, if he gives you multiple choice of three and takes two away, and he says, which one is it? Even we have the understanding of that, do we not? Listen, it gets difficult when the spiritual mature believer has to pick the one. He's got three choices, and they all look good. Now it gets difficult. It would be impossible for a baby believer. It would be impossible maybe for an immature believer who is caught up in his own needs and wants. It shouldn't be hard for a spiritual mature believer because he lives to do the will of God. He has learned to surrender his will all the time to the will of God. I don't know where you are in that, but that's where you ought to be driving and striving. God made it really easy for Jacob regarding God's will for a wife and the mother of the messianic seed. Point number two. What God did, he reduced Jacob's choices to one and only one wife. <laughs> did Jacob know it? He knew it in the morning. Behold, Leah. I didn't write that line. I wish I could have. That was a good line. It probably went more like, ah, Leah. I don't know. <laughs> when he had only one wife, in monogamy. That's the way God intended Genesis 2, 18 through 25. God prepared Jacob for this decision at Bethel by Jacob's ladder. Remember there's a song. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. I don't remember what the name of that song is, but I love that line. That was Bethel for him. And that was a real, a real experience. He'll never have another one like that ever. 
this is this in the Old Testament. This is equivalent to the transfiguration that we talked about last night. That's a big deal. Unfortunately, Jacob overruled the directive will of God, which was God's choice. He overruled God's choice. Why did God permit it? Why would God permit to allow him to overrule his directive will? Because it teaches the importance of human volition in the angelic conflict. I mean, that's just, that, listen, that's the book of Job, isn't it? If you read, if, if you, you want to know how the book of Job, how, why everything is going to happen that happens in the book of Job, read chapters 1 and 2. Read it several times before you read chapter 3. Read it until you understand it, then you'll understand the book. If you never read to understand how the opening chapters of that book, you'll never understand the book ever. That's my opinion, of course. Why did God permit it? Well, it also teaches the permissive and overruling will of God. Three categories. There's the directive will, the permissive will, and the overruling will of God. Now, you need to understand that when he gives a permissive will, be obedient. Will he permit you to go against it? Yep. And then what will he do? He'll overrule you at some point, thank God. And he does that because the plan is more important than you. Thank God. Once the directive will of God is revealed to a spiritually advancing believer, it is no longer just a believer's will versus God's will. And you must understand this because this is the angelic conflict. We live in the day of the angelic conflict. We will until the second coming of Christ in the millennium when the devil and the fallen angel will be put in storage for a thousand years. Why is that? Because volition is the key in the angelic conflict. So, when the directive will of God, when God lays that directive will on you, we call it categorical doctrine, when he lays that on you as a spiritual advancing believer, it is no longer between your will and God's will because now the game has been opened up in the angelic conflict to Satan's will. It is now fair game. Once the directive will has been g given and you understand it, it's no longer God's will versus your will. It is now Satan. It's fair game in the angelic conflict. Oh, please tell me, how many times have we read stories out of the Bible? The example is Garden of Eden, right? I mean, it doesn't get tougher than that. So it teaches what, what, we, what, we, what we learn from these experiences, like, like with Job or like with Jonah, Right? The directive will of God, Jonah, I want you to go and preach to Nineveh, proclaim the, the gospel to Nineveh. Jonah says no. Permissive will of God allows it. Boom, stops him out there in the middle, drops him off, picks him back up, brings him to land, and tells him again the directive will of God. Now, I don't know how many God does that exercise with you before he just lets, lets the fish eat you, but... You know, I don't know, but God does. I mean, he's a patient God, not willing that any should perish. Would like you to go to Nineveh and preach the word of God to the Ninevites. Well, anyhow, so you can see in a story like that, but that it's all over the Bible. I just picked Jonah because it's very obvious to see, isn't it? I mean, that one's, it's a short book, so you can read it, you know. I call it toilet reading. You can actually read that book just within a week. So it's fair game in the angelic conflict. Satan's will versus now, you see, the game changes. Now the game changes. It's now Satan's will versus God's will, and you're the player. You understand that? Satan's will versus God's will, and whichever will the believer accepts. A good example, as Peter in Matthew 16, right? Remember that verses 21 through 23, 
where Jesus says, I've got, you know, I got, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're, they're going to try me. They're going to crucify me. Three days later, I'm going to raise from the dead. And, and then Peter takes him, may it never be. And he says, get behind me, Satan. Right? Uh, and he tells him why he says that to him. Because your mind is not on the things of God. And, uh, and of course, Eve, in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter, verse 3, Eve, same deal. Listen. I'm giving you big, I'm, get, I'm pulling some big guns out to show you, listen, this is true for every person in this room tonight that's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not your enemy, the devil is. D be, and it's up to you to choose which side you're going to play on the game. I mean, you're dressed out to play on God's side, and the first thing I know, you're playing over on the devil's team. What's that deal? I guarantee you. That ain't a good deal. And nobody's going to come out of that deal good. Why would you do that? I mean, there's got to be some motive behind it. And it's usually like with Eve. It's full of self-interest. It's all about me. And it ought to be about Christ. If you're spiritually mature, I don't mean a head filled with a lot of knowledge and no sense. I'm talking about a, 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 a Christian's life that's filled with the word of God and has wisdom. Walk as wise, not foolish. The choices you make determine what is the reality of the word of God that you, you say you're cycling. Satan's will is in conflict with God's will. And Jacob chose to go against God's directive will regarding a category of a wife. A categorical Bible doctrine. The directive will always going to flow down that way. It's always going to flow that way. And here it is. Here's the categorical doctrine of marriage and, and what wife. Right? And, and does he have a format? Yeah. The divine institution, Genesis 2, 18 through 25. Jacob, listen, listen, listen to me now. Jacob felt justified and blamed Laban. The next morning, he felt justified to blame Laban. You deceive me. Mm. The truth of the matter is he deceived himself. The first half of that, listen, the, listen to me. First half of that was true. He got deceived. The first half of that is true, right? The second half isn't. Because when he wound up, listen, did, listen, did he wind up with a wife? Yeah. Who made that choice? Who made the choice for the wife? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the truth of the matter is God did. How do I know? I can prove it. Well, I can prove it. Let, let me prove it. Matthew, the, second, the first chapter of Matthew talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Verse 2 tells you. It tells you that, the, that the, the child that Mary is going to give birth to is from Judah. It's from the tribe of Judah. And Judah comes from Leah. The messianic seed comes from Jacob through Leah to Mary and who we call Jesus Christ. That's how I know. That's how I know that for sure. I'm not guessing on this deal. Now, he got took because he didn't do his homework. He, he, he got took because he didn't do his homework. He didn't pay any attention to the customs of the land he was in because he trusted everybody. He bought the big print and didn't pay attention to the small print. But when he woke up in the morning, he had the wife God chose. And that's for sure. There's no, there's no debate in that. Did he get what he wanted? No. Did he get what he needed? Yes. 
listen, there will be times in your life when you wake up in the morning, you didn't get what you wanted, but God gave you what you needed. And it's going to be up to you to adjust. That's why this lesson is important to your life. That's why this lesson is important to your life. Because let me tell you, God don't make mistakes. Satan's will is in conflict with God's will. Jacob chose to go against God's will in a will for a wife. In the morning when he woke up and he had Leah, God, listen to me now. I said this before, you didn't pay any attention. God eliminated all of his choices. Because, jo listen, Jacob would have made the wrong choice. Rachel was the wrong choice. He was there to find a wife for the seed of Christ, people. He's not there just to find a wife. That what he is the heir of the patriarch that has to be the seed of Christ. He is the heir apparent. He's the last patriarch. Jacob felt justified and blamed Laban and became disoriented to the plan of God for his life in marriage. Listen, now here's a principle. When God's plan no longer fits Jacob's, Jacob throws God's out. So much for Bethel. So much for Bethel. So you didn't pay any attention when I talked to Bethel. I went through a detailed description of what God told him how to do. I, I will go wherever you go. I will watch every step. I'll walk you through the minefield. He eliminates the choice so he won't do it. He, he does this. This is a favor. This is a favor he does to this man. In the morning, he wakes up, he has Leah, and he kicks God out of his life. God's plan, when God's plan no longer fit, it, fit into the plan Jacob had for his life, he threw God's plan out. We call this, in Romans, the fifth chapter, five through eight, we call this Operation Flesh. I want you to open that up. I want you to see four things about Operation Flesh. I want you to, see, I want you to look at Romans 8, because this is where you get your mess. This is where you dig a hole in your life and bad decisions that can be very difficult to get out of. Listen to what it says. In Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 5 through 8, and I'm looking at how you dig a hole by bad decisions. The flesh, the flesh sets its mind on the flesh. See that? Mind sets his flesh out of flesh. That's the worst thing in your life. Somebody does something to you and you immediately react and you charge back. They say something in the flesh and it hits your flesh and you flesh them back. That's flesh with a mindset on the flesh. That's a, that's a, that's a law. That's a losing, losing deal. Nothing good comes out of the flesh. In Romans 8, chapter verse 8, it tells you nothing good comes out of the flesh. That's why God gave you the Holy Spirit. The second thing, it says that when you set your mind on the flesh, it brings, it brings spiritual death. By that, I mean temporal death and hostility towards God. Now, you're going to see this in Jacob. You're going to see it in Jacob. It, thirdly, it says it, is not, it does not subject itself to the law of God. And fourth, not even able to. That's the mess you get in. And Jacob has just done that. When he woke up the next morning and he looked over, he had a bride wife. And you know what he called her? A bribed wife. 
There is no such thing in the Bible. When he looked over the next morning, God had eliminated all the choices, all of his bad choices, so that he could make a good choice. God eliminated all the bad choices that he would have made and gave him Leah. He looked over and saw Leah and saw it as a bad choice. Only person that made that choice was God, and God told him he would do that. He told him at Bethel. And let me tell you, things are not going to go well. This is called Operation Flesh. Flesh, with its mindset on the flesh, brings temporal death. It brings hostility towards God. It is not subject to the laws of God, the things that God has laid out for them, and is not even able to do so. Doesn't have a heart for it, does not want to engage in it. Operation Flesh, we call it old man cosmos diabolicus. Operation Flesh blinded him to the reality of the truth of the directive will of God for a wife that God wanted to choose because it involved God. Listen, who, who, who chose Mary? Uh, any, who chose Mary? God. That's who chose him. He chose. Did, I, I, guess J, I guess Joseph had a big deal in that whole deal, right? Right? Not according to the story. He wasn't a player in that deal. He didn't consult with Jacob with Joseph first. He consulted with Jacob last. <laughs> Listen, I don't know what choices you made to where you got, but in the morning you wake up and you look over there and there's your wife. I don't care whether you think you chose it or not. You got it. Now you, you, you change your life compatible with the will of God. If you wake up in the morning, that's your wife. That's, you wake up in the morning, that's your husband. That is your husband. And whether it was a good choice for you is not the deal anymore. Is the only choice. The only choice. If you wake up in the morning and that's your wife, that's the only choice. It better be your wife. But if that's your wife, that's, that's the choice. So quit talking about trading in or getting a new model or whatever it is. Forget that foolishness. Forget it. Now look, here's what happened with Jacob. Jacob falls in love with a mystical mate. He's married. Not his choice. God gave him what he needed, not what he wanted. Listen, this may shock you, but he did it for you too. Are you married? Then he gave you what you needed, not what you wanted. So you need to adjust to the plan. What are you going to do? You're going to complain, grumble and gripe and moan and groan and, and complain, blame? That's not of God, people. That is not of God. That is of the flesh. Jacob was in love with a mystical mate based on sight, not faith, right? I mean, he saw her. She had a beautiful shape and all that kind of stuff. And it was pretty. And uh, this, that, that, that was his dream. But in the morning, he got what, God gave him what he needed to complete the plan of God. Oh, God, I love your will. Oh, God, I love your Bible. Oh, God, until it, until it doesn't fit your plan. Second Corinthians tells us we walk by faith, not by. Let me tell you, you'll get your life in more trouble walking by sight than anything in the whole wide world. That's Jacob's problem. It's Jacob's problem. Let me tell you, it'll be your problem too. You'll dig holes that'll be a mess in Operation Flesh. Five, Jacob engaged in fantasy. 
be engaged in fantasy. Do not do this. He engaged in fantasy so as not to deal with reality. Little scape hatch. People don't do this. In fantasy, Jacob was able to create his own perfect mate. It's the concept grass green around the other side. You know what you're in? You're into imagination. Imagination. You know what you're in when you get there? You're in this 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, verse 5. Write it down. You're in the 2 Corinthians 10, 5. You ought to be into Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Get out of it. Ephesians 3, 20 through 21. See, many of you probably know 2 Corinthians 10, 5. You probably can quote it. Yet you won't live it. Because you have this little fantasy world you slide into in the imagination. Your little escape hatch from reality. Listen, you, you want to escape hatch from reality? Walk by faith, not by sight. N none of this create my own little world that's not real. Jesus warned this person that engages in that. Jesus warned this person that he would love the one and hate the other if you engage in it. You will love the one and hate the other. And so it was. He loved Rachel, which was a, a fantasy wife, and hated Rachel, uh, Leah, and hated Leah, who was a reality wife, right? What a mess. Jesus said that in Matthew 6, 24. He says, this is reality. This is what will happen. You get into that kind of a game in your life, here's exactly what will happen. The person who engages, engages in this type of operation, flesh or imagination, old man, cosmos diabolicus, fantasy, becomes emotionally disconnected and numb to the truth of reality. That's a real dangerous place in your marriage. This person will go through the motion of emotion and his heart will turn to hardness. You can read about it in Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 20 through 22, and then down into 31, 32. Now, at this point, you probably don't not. This is not your best Bible study because we got too close to home. You need to make these changes in your life. Uh, I don't have anybody in mind when I teach these classes. I pray, study, turn it over to the Holy Spirit, and this is what you get. But it's for somebody in this room and somebody on that Internet that needs to hear this message. Just be other people other than just Ron Adema. <clears throat> over the years, in studying this story, I've come, I've come to feel sorry for Rachel. who was betrayed by believers she loved and trusted, her father, and the man who said he loved her. She got betrayed. She got by, betrayed by two believers who said they loved her.
in the morning, when Jacob saw Rachel, uh, when he looked over and saw uh, Leah, he should have right then adjusted his life to the directive will of God. God eliminated his choices because he'd have made the wrong choice and God tried to spare him that. God made the choice for him. And he should have been happy with that choice. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good, right? How about Romans 12, 2? Transformation is about bringing the will of God into a place of life where it's good, acceptable, and perfect. How about that? In the morning, this guy, when he looked over and saw Leah, he had the reality wife. He didn't have the fantasy one. And she wasn't a bribe wife. She was a bride wife. Nobody tricked God. And what he should have done that morning as an honorable believer in God who had just had the Bethel experience, he should have, first of all, considered Rachel his sister-in-law. Is that who she was? In the morning? He should have considered her and considered her a very good friend. Because that's the truth of reality, right? I make this up, people. That's reality. This Now he must walk by faith and not by sight. This is reality. This is the hand you play. This is the directive will of God, geographically, operationally, mentally. And he should have explained to her, this is the way God works this, his plan in our life. It, we may have never seen it, but God saw it for us and dealt this for us. And we'll both be better off this way. Had a word of prayer with her and let her go her way. Let her, let her seek God and find the God, the person, the mate that God has chosen for her. That's what an honorable man would have done. A man who had had a Bethel experience. That's what he would have done. He wouldn't have drugged her, dra dra dragged her into a, a bigamy. Honorable man wouldn't bring her into bigamy and treat Leah as a bribe wife for the rest of his life. which he did. And how did that play out in the lives of their children? Rachel and Joseph. Listen, God had to take Joseph and send him into a foreign country as a slave to get his head back. There's so many bad things comes out of this stuff. An honorable person would have done honorable things. Monogamy is the Bible's way. Bigamy is not. I don't care who does it. It's not right. What a mess. What would I tell Rachel? I'll tell you what I'd tell Rachel. I would say, Rachel, God has a, a mate for you that's perfect. In the plan of God. So set your mind on things above and not things on earth. That's what I told her. God has a wonderful plan for your life. I, I'd have told her Colossians 3 2. I'd have told her Proverbs 18 22. I would explain to her James 1 17 that we studied last Sunday. That's what I have explained to her. 
I would have said to her that the plan of God is immutable. Live in the plan of God because it's immutable. That's what it is. It's immutable. The directive will of God is immutable. See, this is all about the angelic conflict. Once the directive will of God was given to him at Bethel, reminded him at Bethel what he already knew, but reminded him how the stakes were so high. Bethel told him the stakes in Haran are so high, you got to be on your toes. You're about to walk into a minefield. And so it is. What chaos, what chaos the devil created in the life of the last patriarch heir to the messianic seed. This doesn't have to be your life, 1 Corinthians 14, 33. God is not the God of chaos. He's a God of order. When chaos is in your life, you know who's pushing that button. You see, Leah, like Mary, was the chosen mother of the Messianic seed. And we're told that in Matthew one, two. And we're told that in Genesis 35, 23 through 24. We're told that. And so there it is. There it is. Let's close in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we always want to throw your plan out when it doesn't fit ours. Rather than throw ours out and fit it, fit our life to yours. And when we're in that, when we're in that boat, we don't have to float. We don't have to take that boat down the river. Or up the creek without a paddle, as they used to say where I grew up. I don't have to live that life. We have the truth. We don't. The, the devil is the father of lies, John 8, 44. God is the author of truth. We don't have to live lies. But we do have to live truth. Not half-truths. Well, I pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our life. We don't think as the world thinks anymore. Full of confusion. It is sad in my heart to think that Jacob, having had the Bethel experience, would walk himself into a minefield and get blown up like this. It saddens me. It saddens me in the morning that he didn't understand that Bethel promise that God gave him when he woke up in the morning and saw Leah. God had done for him the greatest blessing in the whole world. Took the choices, the, all the bad choices. He, cho he took all the bad choices out of his life so that he could help him make the good choices. And still he couldn't. What a mess. What a mess. I pray this. That we could grasp the directive will of God as it's laid out. And hold on to it because God will honor it. God, God is every bit the structure of the fulfillment of the promises he's given to our life. May we understand it and believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.